Jones and Shelbyville. Welcome to the service today. If you're joining us online, we are being hosted by Living Stones in Shelbyville with Pastor Eddie Reed and Pastor Kim. And we want to just say thank you. They're one of our One New Man Embassy churches in Shelbyville, which is just outside of Nashville. And if you're looking for a good church, you're looking for a fellowship that is rooted and grounded in truth, speaks the anointing, and is, has Hebrew roots teaching and is connected to giving to Israel, you have found yourself a home in Living Stones Church. So anyway, I wanna welcome all of you here and uh, today. I'm gonna be bringing a word, and it's a question that is asked all the time, and the question is this, why should Christians non-Jewish Christians celebrate the feasts of the Lord. I mean, isn't this the New Testament and we don't have to do all that stuff? And the answer is yes, you don't have to do it. But the question is, are you missing something by not doing it? Um, so we're gonna explore that today and I think it will be really, really good. One of the words the Lord is speaking to us right now, you know, when, when the COVID first hit, the Lord, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what, what is this? What, what are you trying to speak to the people? Because, you know, anytime a plague or something like this comes, it's always a wise question to ask yourself, Lord, what is this? And he gave me Haggai chapter one. And Haggai chapter one, verse two says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying to this people, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, this is the time for yourselves to dwell in paneled houses and this temple, this temple lies in ruins. And he says in verse five, he says, now therefore thus saith the Lord, consider, consider your ways. I think if anything has happened through uh, the whole COVID-19 is that I think that the house of the Lord, the church, has had a wake-up call that it is kind of a sleeping giant. I mean, people and governments and media try to label us uh, non not essential. You see what's happening in New York right now where they're attacking the synagogues and the churches only wanting to have 10 people. And so there is definitely an attack that the enemy sees as a threat against the church. And I want to say that the enemy is not afraid of the institutional church, the building or the institution of what it does. What it's afraid of, it is fearful, the enemy is fearful that the church will start tabernacling, tabernacling with the Lord to where the temple, because he says, listen, you live in your paneled houses, everything's fine, but my temple lies in ruin. So he's not talking about the condition of the building. He's talking about the spiritual condition that he is not tabernacling there. And so that's why this Feast of Tabernacles in the biblical year 5781 has been so important. So let's, let's review why you, you should know why, you need to know why you would celebrate the Feast of the Lord. You need to see the benefits, but you also need to feel, you need to have an experience. Why, why, what is the experience that's being made available? So I wanna start with Revelations 3 and 11, and it says, Revelations chapter three, verse 11, it says, but I have come swiftly, so cling tightly to what you have. Okay, so that no one may seize your crown of victory or translates out in the Hebrew, let no one steal your reward. Is there a reward for meeting with the Lord on his feast days? It's just a question. Is there a reward? Because a reward is a thing that is given for an effort or an achievement or obedience. If you've achieved something, if you're obedient, uh, if you win something, then you get a reward, okay? So could it be that there's blessings or rewards with the feast? The next scripture the Lord has given me as a foundation for this morning, and I wanna thank you again. Christy's here, and we wanna thank you for having us. We wanted to fly and be there with you, but because of circumstances, uh, 
we're going to do it this way. But I think this is really good because I want to welcome all Kurt Landry ministry partners, House of David, and also uh, all of Living Stones coming together as a three-stranded cord for this word. And I'm very excited to bring it to you. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord? your burnt offering and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? Then he says, that's a question. Then he explanation point, he says, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. So I want you to frame, and and if you're uh, watching online, go into the comments and say, obedience slash reward. Because when you get blessings and rewards from the Lord, they don't just fall from the sky There's something you do, you do the small thing, and God does the big thing. So that's a principle that we need to understand, and it really comes down to a very small biblical principle that is major, that is as long as the earth exists, there will be seed time and harvest. So you you sow a seed of a good deed, you sow a seed of faith, you sow a seed of believing, and then you reap the reward of what you have sown. Okay, so let's pray. Father God, we come to you now in the name of Yeshua. And Lord, I just thank you that that you're going to bring revelation to each and every one of us. And Lord, you're going to anoint me to share your heart with the people in Yeshua's name. Amen. So, excuse me, the Feast of, of Sukkot, Tabernacles, is to, it's a celebration to remember or, uh, to literally understand that the children of Israel forgot their God, were in Egypt, became enslaved by the culture by forgetting God's ways. God sends a deliverer, Moses, and it takes him 40 years to get them into the promised land. And while he did that, they lived in booths or in sukkahs. And that's why the Lord says, I want you to make sure that your children understand, this is critical with this, please hear me, that when you are in a wilderness transition, going from any issue in your life, from slavery into promise, that interim period between slavery and promise, that I will shelter you. Because that's the problem. When people get delivered from slavery, They lose hope during the interim and they never make it to the promise because they quit too soon. So what Tabernacles is all about is saying, remind the children of Israel that I was tabernacling with them all during the wilderness to get them to the promised land. And that is a lesson that you need to teach yourselves and your children because there's always wilderness seasons in a life. And that's when people backslide, that's when people turn away from God, and that's when people actually quit too soon on God's promises or goals. So we're going to have a Bible study now, and so let's move into Leviticus chapter 23, 33 through 35. Let's see what the Bible says. Leviticus chapter 23, 33 through 35, I'll be reading out of the New King James. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, okay, I'm going to stop right there. Speak to the children of Israel. What are children? What are they? They're your family. They're your offspring. They carry your DNA. So God is saying, speak to your children, your DNA, your family. Please hear me. This, he's speaking to the family. The body of Christ should consider itself grafted into the family, okay? You're not foreigners or strangers. You are family. That's why the message of the one new man is so important. It's about family, okay? Saying, on the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. So what he's saying is, once a year, let's gather as a family, Let's have like a family powwow or a vacation or a gathering and let's examine where your relationship is with Heavenly Father and yourself and yourselves. Let's examine those relationships 
so that we can take them to a higher level for this new year because we understand relationship is everything. <clears throat> when you don't have a strong relationship with the Lord, then you have to resort to religious practices to undergirt or cause hamburger helper to make you feel like you're having an experience. If you're not having a real tabernacling experience with God, then we invent things to make it appear that we're having an experience, okay? That's what religion does. On verse 35, on the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no, con uh, no customary work on it. Leviticus 23 and 36. For seven days, you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And on the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. A sacred assembly is when we gather together to honor the Father, a time to experience spiritual renewal through a divine appointment that God orders that we don't. It's called in Hebrew, it's a moed, M-O-A-D, a moed is when God sends you an invitation to come to his table. It's a time of awakening. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of making positive confession. And it's time to also confess of sins and shortcomings. It's a time of recommitment to the Lord. It's a, a time to activate divine purpose. That is a sacred assembly. Leviticus 23 and 37 and 38. <clears throat> now these are the keys right here. These are the feast of the Lord. Now I want you to, if you're looking in your Bible, if you go to Leviticus 23, chapter 37, I want you to underline that in your Bible. These are the feasts of the Lord. It doesn't say these are the feasts of Israel. These are the feast of the Lord. So this is a father and his family and he's saying, I'm going to come once a year and for seven, seven days, I want to examine our tabernacling abiding relationship between you and I and you and your family. And we want to take it and like a family reunion, take it to another level. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be a holy convocation to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice, and a drink offering, and everything of its day. So this is truly a celebration of first fruits. What first fruits is, you give of the Lord of the first fruits of your increase. This isn't a sacrificial giving. The Lord has blessed you, you have an increase, and you give of the increase. If you've had no increase, you don't give anything because first fruits is over and above your tithes and your offering. It is in offerings, many offerings are first fruits. <clears throat> but on tabernacles, what this is, is this is the first fruits of your increase, whether it be in your, your, your wine, your grapes, your, your meat, your, your uh, produce of your land, the, the poultry, the livestock, he says, everything that I have caused to increase, come and give an offering to me so that I can bless it even more, okay? So in verse 38, it says, besides the Sabbath of the Lord, besides your gifts, beside your vows, and besides all your freewill offerings, which I give to you. So the besides is an addition. This is the only feast of tabernacles where you come as a family and you give in addition to, why? Because it's totally a relational season of the increase and you're telling your father in heaven, thank you. Leviticus 23 and 39. Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of your land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. And on the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. And on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. So you have a Sabbath rest. And this is a time, tabernacles is a time of divine healing, divine renewal of relationships. It's also family uniting and family healing time. Okay, 
Leviticus 23, 40 and 41. And you shall take for yourself <clears throat> on the first day and the first of the, of the fruit of the beautiful trees, branches, palm trees, the broads of leaves, the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice. That's one of the keys of tabernacling. Let's enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. It's a time to rejoice. Rejoice means R-E, return to the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. This is a time where Lord, look at all you've blessed us. You've blessed our cattle. You've blessed our lambs. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've blessed our fruit. You've blessed our produce. You've blessed our water and our wine. You've blessed everything. And now I'm giving back to you to let you know that you have done it all, that every good and perfect gift has come from above. And I want to rejoice in that. Why? Because I want the same result and more this next year. Because I'm not coming to you as an entitlement child. I'm coming to you as a thankful son and daughter of the king, that my God paid a price. He created me in God's image, and I want to be able to give him thanks. Because the creation always needs to thank the creator. And you shall keep this feast of the Lord for seven days in a year. It shall be a statute forever in your generation. So I want you to read verse 41 again, Leviticus 23 and 41. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. This isn't to the feast to Israel. You shall keep it as the feast of the Lord for seven days in a year. It shall be a statute, which means a law, it shall be a law forever. And I want to share with you that in the Hebrew, forever actually means forever. It just simply means what it says, that this is never, this was never to be changed. Forever in a generations, you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. So here's what is the Lord doing? He's giving you detailed instructions. He's telling you, this is how you give. This is how you build a booth or a sukkah. Do it this way, that way. Why? It's all branches and pieces of the things of your life that blessed you with provision and protection for the year and that you come underneath it and you make kind of like, an, like a tent of an altar where you go in and you say, Lord, this is flimsy, but you truly have provided for me. You provided for us when we were being separated from our sin and slavery through the wilderness experience into our promised land. And we need to teach that to our children's children. So in Leviticus 23 and 42, the feasts keep family as family and nations as nations, because this is called culture or, and, and traditions. Culture and traditions is what keeps us on track with our family identity and our national identity. Verse 42, and you shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelis, Israelites, shall dwell in booths, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So this is where we get Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God is with us, tabernacling abiding, dwelling with us. It's key that we remember and stay connected with our true identity, with the true God. Where fear, doubt, and confusion comes, it's when outside sources bring mixture and try to steal our identity. And when the identity is stolen, the inheritance is not access accessible. So now I'm gonna switch gears with you. That's the foundation out of the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus in regards that we understand this is a feast to rejoice. It's a first fruits feast. It's a relationship feast where father from heaven comes to his children on earth and say, let's be thankful for seven days of what I provided for all this last year during your harvest. Also, let's remember where you came from, that when you were in your toughest time between slavery and promise, that I, I took care of you and I kept you in boots. But let's also remember 
that I didn't remove the Dead Sea, I parted the Dead Sea, just like I parted the Jordan when I brought you into the land of promise, that I am your provider, I am your provision, that you can love me and trust me, and it doesn't make any difference circumstantially whether you're in a time of slavery, wilderness, or promise, I am the same God yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, O Jacob, you are not destroyed. We serve a non-changing God. Praise God, we have an election coming up. Praise God, I pray that the election goes in God-fearing, God-biblical worldviews and that we align our lives with God because your vote is a seed. It's a covenant. When you sow your seed into death, if you sow seed into a death party, then it brings death to you. If you sow your seed into a life party, it will bring life to you. You need to vote and you need to vote and be found on God's side. It's bigger than politics. It's saying, Lord, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the one who gives me very life I breathe, and I will take my vote, which is a privilege from the Lord, and I will vote for God's ways in Yeshua's name. Let's go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap. So let's switch gears for a minute and let's start to unpack. Okay, that was one scripture, Old Testament. What does it really mean to tabernacle? And for me as a non-Jewish person, why should I celebrate this feast that the Jews have been celebrating for years? Well, let's look at that. Revelation 21, verse one and two. Revelation 21, verse one and two. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I saw John, so no, then, then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. To do what? Prepared as a bride adorns from her husband. All the feasts of the Lord, all of them, Passover, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Tabernacles, all the feasts of the Lord, all of them are previews of coming attractions. They're all preparatory for this event that we just read about. This is preparing us to rule and reign in the millennial reign with Yeshua in the New Jerusalem. Technically, the New Jerusalem coming down on earth is tabernacling with the earth to restore it once again. It is the ultimate feast of tabernacle. But what does the Lord do before this time? He prepares you and I to be the bride and he wants us to be those wise virgins that keep our lamps filled and our wicks trimmed. So now I wanna to talk to you about a divine appointment. A divine appointment is when God calls an event and it's not man-made. Revelation 21 and three. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and they and and God and God himself is with them and be their god. So the key here in verse 3 is they shall be his people. His people, his sons, his daughters, his kings, his priests according to the order of Melchizedek. You're not slaves and servants, you are his people. You are sons and daughters. You're not slaves. You are sons because the sons know what God is doing and daughters know what God is doing. So the key to tabernacling and celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the things to consider is it enhances the experience to feel like you belong in God's family and God's family belongs in you. Revelation 21, four and five. 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write these, write for these words are true and faithful. So understanding that the time of tabernacles is a time to fellowship in the abiding presence of God, to receive truth, and to know that he's faithful. So what is one of the most faithful things you can do for anybody? And that is to honor them with your presence, that you show up. Because sowing isn't just money. Sowing is also time, task, and activity. But when the, God, when the Lord calls you and you actually show up, and I'm going to say this again, you as a New Testament believer do not, and Jewish people, you do not have to celebrate or show up for the Feast of Tabernacles. You don't have to. But I can tell you this, if you don't, if there's any reward in it, and there is, you will not be receiving it because you chose to take your time your breath, and your life, and sow it into something else. That's why I preached a message years ago, a prophetic message, and it was, and your feet tell the truth. Because people can say they love you. People can say that they're faithful. People can say they love church. But if they only show up once a month, they don't love the church. Those that are there every time the door opens love the church. And the reason you know they love the church is because they're putting the priority of their time into showing up in the tabernacle because every house of God should be a tabernacling place for the Lord. That's where we get the word temple. Revelation 21, 6 and 7. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. And I will give the fountain of living water like freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God. And listen to this, here's the key, verse seven, and he shall be my son. So here's the Lord talking about a tabernacling experience, and he says, the reward of tabernacling, Eve says, I am the beginning and the end, but I want to tabernacle with you. And he says, it brings sonship, a revelation of sonship. Revelation 21 and eight. These are the ones that will not tabernacle with the Lord, okay? But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which is burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And see, no one wants to preach that, but could it be that there is so much of all of the above in the modern day church culture? Could it be that for, let's say, 1,700 years since Constantine, during the Roman period, outlawed celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles? That Could it be that that religious spirit knew that if it wanted to capture a people, it captured its culture, captured its calendar, captured its rewards, captured its identity, captured its purpose, captured its destiny to steal its inheritance, to leave a legacy in the lake of fire? Is there any real conviction anymore? Do we just say, okay, you're forgiven. Let's restore you without any true godly sorrow and repentance because all these things, how can we, how can we as a nation call ourselves the church when it says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers will vote for candidates who kill babies and not only kill the babies, but kill them at birth and sell their body parts 
If they're not people, then why is there a multi, multi, hundreds of millions of dollar industry selling body parts from babies if they're not people? This is an abomination to the Lord. And if we outlaw it and we reverse Rose versus Wade, which we will do in Yeshua's name by faith, it will still happen. But the key is, as a nation, in our constitutional covenant with God, in our prayers and declarations, we do not need taxpayer money and our government endorsing the death of babies because then we worship Moloch. Then we become the witchcraft. Then we become the occult. And we must not vote and we must vote this down and we must get Supreme Court justices in that will cancel this sin because this sin has brought all the disaster. I don't understand why everyone is so caught up and worried about climate change and this change and that. Could it be, could it be that the hellfire and the winds and the eruptions and the earthquake and all the awful things that are happening are a wage of sin? Could it be that as a nation that we have provoked a God, a God of great long suffering, but is, could it be even since COVID has started with Haggai chapter one, could it be that we have not considered our ways? We have not changed our ways. It's a question that we need to ask. And it's a question we need to answer during the time of tabernacles. Because we come into the fall feast we have an awakening blast at the Feast of Trumpets. We have the atonement where we repent for our sins. And now we're at the end of tabernacles and you say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. And Lord, I choose to abide and to tabernacle with you. So as I get ready to close, I want you to hear this. Acts chapter 7, 44. Acts chapter 7, 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness. And in the witness, as he appointed, instruction to Moses made according to the pattern that he had seen. Do you understand that God does not want you to lose the habits and pattern of your fathers. We're in a season, praise God. We're in a glorious season right now where Malachi chapter four is starting to manifest. And if you read in Malachi four, it says that the hearts of the father are turned to the children and the children's hearts to the fathers. That's why you see so much emphasis on why are we returning to the Hebrew roots of the faith? because we're returning to the pattern of the Father. Why are we learning the instruction? Because we are returning to the ways of the Father. And why are we even honoring the Father? Because we're returning to the love of the Father. Acts chapter 7, 45 and 46, which our fathers have received and received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, who God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. God's tabernacling reminds us that those who tabernacle with God drive out those who do not tabernacle with God. Think about that. Those who tabernacle overcome. So let's talk about Jesus as I close. It's interesting that when Jesus was in Jerusalem at Tabernacles, that's when he said, if you'll come to me, you'll thirst no more. He was saying he was the living water. He was the water from the pool of Siloam that was brought up to the temple. 
He's the bread of life. He's the living water. But what else is he? John 8 and 31. I took this verse to read to you out of the Faithful Version Bible. And the word, I love the word. This Bible right here, I never put anything on top of it because of this scripture. And the word became flesh. It's not being religious. It's just a habit and a pattern that I have. This is my Jesus. Yeah, I can take it on my phone and my pad. I have all the tools. But I always take this. It makes a statement. I'm unashamed of the gospel. I know that if it wasn't for tabernacling with the Lord, I would be nothing. I'm blessed to be alive. And the Lord has blessed me with a beautiful experience with the Lord, a beautiful family, and a beautiful ministry includes you. And I'm proud of this word that became flesh. Now for me, I don't divide it in old and new. To me, it was Jesus in the beginning and it's Jesus in the end. But listen to this scripture, fresh this morning. And the word became flesh and did what? Tabernacled amongst us. Why do you think Satan, through Constantine, so hates the feast? He doesn't want you to know that Jesus is the word. Jesus tabernacles with you and he'll keep you whether you're in a big rock house or in a very fragile sukkah booth. It doesn't make any difference if outward circumstances. He will always love and take care of you. He tabernacled amongst us and we observe and beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten with the Father, full of grace and truth. A lot of you don't know this, but Jesus was born on tabernacles. If you think about it, just I want you to think about it from a Jewish filter. You think the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had all the kosher instruction to Moses, would take the Messiah and actually put him into an animal's trough. I, I don't think so. I think that the God of kosher, <laughs> wouldn't it make much more sense that Jesus was born on the Feast of Tabernacles so that he really wasn't in a barn, but a booth? And doesn't it make perfect sense that the beautiful picture, the beautiful picture that there was an awakening blast and a repentance. And that when the trumpet sounds, he'll return at the sound of what? The trump. Because he came at the sound of the trump. See how something begins is how it finishes. Just something to think about. I want to close with this parable. This is one of my favorite parables, and this is a parable of the Feast of Tabernacles. If you want to know the heart of the Lord of why you as a non-Jewish person should take seven days out, according to God's pattern and calendar, and tabernacle with your father, I think this would be a word from him. If Jesus came and I got out of the seat, and you said, okay, we've heard from Rabbi Kurt. That's all good. But Jesus, what do you say? And I think if Jesus sat down right now, I think he would quote himself out of John 15, 1 and 3. And he would say, children, now listen to me. I am the true vine. My father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. 
That's what he's doing with you and I right now. He is pruning and taking away. He prunes that it do, he's not trying to harm it. He prunes it that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. And Jesus says, abide or tabernacle. Tabernacle in me. I'm your booth. I'm your sukkah. I'm your protection. I'm your provider. Abide in me and I in you. See, this body, this is your booth. You get to use it for a short period of time. It's fragile and it's here between when you were born in heaven you come to your wilderness experience of your 70, 80, 90 years of life, if you're fortunate. And then you go into your promise. This is your tabernacle. And when you accept Jesus as the Lord, then he abides in your booth, which is fragile. He goes on to say, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as the branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Verse seven, if, there's always an if, pay attention to the if. I always think of if as I, F, in faith. In faith, if I, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. You shall ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in Yeshua's name. And Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity of the revelation that you desire to tabernacle with us, that you prepare a table for us in the midst of our enemies. And Father God, forgive us for maybe missing opportunities and not coming when you have called. Forgive us, Lord, for not understanding some of the richness of the heritage and the culture that you have left us. But Lord, your word says, return to me and I will return to you. And Lord, we return to you with our full heart. And Lord, if, if, if you don't know the Lord right now, just say, Father God, in Yeshua's name, I repent of my sin. I repent of doubt and unbelief. I repent of worshiping my own thoughts and my own evil ways. And Lord, I return to you this day. Lord, I wanna be a son or a daughter. I don't want to be a slave or a servant. I want to be welcome in your house. Lord, I desire to tabernacle with you and you to tabernacle with me. Thank you, Father, that you are the first fruits of many. Thank you, Father, that we are grafted into these branches. Thank you, Father. Just raise your hands right now, everywhere. Just raise your hands. Just raise your hands. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, just thank him right now. Thank him. Just thank him. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, 
Now, repent for any complaining of any of the pruning that has taken place. Lord, I forgive me for complaining. I really like that branch. I like that. Lord, forgive me for complaining during the pruning. I, didn't, I did not realize, Lord, how much pruning I needed to be done. It's almost like it feels like nothing's left, Lord, but I thank you. I trust you. I trust you that in the end, you desire that I bear fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. Thank you, Lord, that I'm going to return to rejoicing. Thank you, Lord, I'm going to network with godly people. Thank you, Lord, I'm going to write down my vision. And thank you, Lord, I'm going to speak out my vision. Thank you, Lord, I'm going to abide in you and and love you and trust you. And Father God, I ask that you remove all hindrances far from me, Lord, Father God. And Lord, I come to you this day. I come to you this day and I ask you, Lord, Lord, forgive me for not tabernacling and understanding the tabernacling principle of the opportunity that you have given me. Thank you, Lord. Maybe I've separated you from old and new, but Lord, I decree and declare you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the Alpha and the Omega. In the beginning was the Word and the Word, and in the end there is the Word, and it's all you, Father God. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Just lift your hands up. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that has sanctified us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that consecrated us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that heals us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that restores us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that resets us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that reclaims us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that heals us. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, on this. We come to you at the end of this Feast of Tabernacles, and I know it's one day after, but Lord, we rejoice in you. We decree that let everything that has breath Praise the Lord, that you are the Lord Almighty. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You are our Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Rapha. You are Jehovah Sidkenu. You are the mighty God. Lord, Father God, I thank you that everyone that is within the sound of my voice stir up with holy fire. Let the holy fire of God fall right now in Shelbyville. Thank the holy fire of God fall in everyone that is watching and being a part of this service. Let the fire of God fall in living stones. Thank you, Lord, as they prepare a tabernacle for for children that need help and and young women that need help. Lord, let that tabernacling of that house and that safe house come forth now with fire fire. Thank you, Lord, that all the provision is coming. Thank you, all the vision is coming. Thank you, Lord, that all the volunteers and the helpers are coming. Thank you, Lord, for a fresh fire. Thank you, Lord, for taking over in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for tabernacling with us in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let the Holy Spirit come and the Lord come and lay hands on all and stir up the gifts of the Spirit within them in Yeshua's name, in the mighty, mighty name of Yeshua. Well, God bless you. We love you. Thank you, Pastor Eddie and Pastor Kim for having us. Uh, We're going to say to you now, shalom, shalom. God bless you. And uh, I'm going to turn this service over to Pastor Eddie. We love you and we bless you and shalom. And we'll see you again soon.